Father God, we're thankful to be gathered here today. It is always a pleasure and an honor to get into your word. This study through the book of Revelation has been awesome. It's so good to learn about you, Lord, and the prophecies that you have laid out for, for the coming days. We pray that as we, um, as we dig into two chapters that we're not exactly sure how this will look. We pray that you would help us to understand what we need to understand and be okay with the things that are still a bit of a mystery. For each one of us, I pray that you would help us to practically apply this to our lives. God, we want to learn more about you. We want to grow in you. And so we pray your blessing upon this time of study. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have made it as far as verse 14 of chapter 11. I want to kind of remind you that we're in the midway point of the tribulation. Remember, we've been using Daniel's timeline of kind of how this tribulation will go. And remember, it's going to be this seven-year period. First three and a half years, there will be this deal made where the temple will get rebuilt. It'll, It'll be kind of a peaceful time for the nation of Israel. In the midway point, the Antichrist is going to reveal himself as, uh, I guess, who he is. He is going to um, uh, make everybody worship him. And then for the next three and a half years, things will get crazy. So that's what we're covering today. Now, these chapters are very interesting because we're going to be kind of going to and fro in different timelines in different locations. Um, Chapter 12, we're going to find ourselves in a very interesting place that we see in our world right now. We're going to be in a little slice of earth where it's chaos. The focal point is going to be in Jerusalem at the temple. It's kind of interesting because this week it was the same exact focal point for the whole entire world. It was interesting when you're reading about Israel and Palestine and what's going on. And I was reading an article from one of the you know, AP or New York Times, and they had a map of where the battle, you know, kind of where things were, were going on. And it was interesting because it looked like one of the maps that's in the back of your Bible. It had like the temple and, you know, all these different things. And, and it's interesting because it's a, basically a 35 acre plot of land that they're fighting over. And that's exactly what we're going to see in our text. And that's where we've been. And as I was reading different things about it, there was a guy who was writing an opinion piece about Israel and Palestine. He was trying to explain how this whole thing started. And I thought, boy, you're going to have to go way back further than that. You're going to have to go back to the book of Genesis to really understand this conflict. So chapter 11, we started in Jerusalem and we're going to end in heaven. Chapter 12 and 13 will take us to a few interesting places in a couple different times. It will also introduce some new characters to the Revelation drama. Today we will meet a pregnant woman. We're going to meet a baby. We're going to meet a dragon. And we're going to meet two beasts. The first beast is a world dictator. And the second is a false prophet, which will be a religious leader of the world. Pastor that I enjoy listening to, he called these two beasts the Beastie Boys. But first let's go back and let's pick up where we were last week. In heaven, and the elders in heaven are going to praise the Lord because the time of Jesus is upon us. Verse 15. Then the seven angels sounded. and There were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat down before God on their throne fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, We give thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, the one who is the one who was, and the one who is to come. Because you've taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry and the wrath has come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged. And that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Now, if this were a movie screen, it would all go black and it would say thousands of years ago. We move on to chapter 12. It says, now a great sign appeared in heaven. 
a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she was... Where, where she has a place prepared by God, that she should feed there for 1,260 days. You say, okay, wait, what, what, what is happening? So, so it says at the beginning, we're, we're in heaven, but we're in a different time period. We have here a visual story of Christ's birth, so we know that this is in the past. This is in Jesus' time. Let's go back. It says, now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, in her head, a garland of 12 stars. So we have a woman, pregnant woman. Who is it and why all the images, right? So I was reading this week and, and there was a very interesting point of view that something that I didn't always think about is that there's a really good theory about why John used so many images, Remember that he was in jail, and so getting this letter out could be a very difficult thing. It's very often that a suppression happens when you try to get something out, and so it very well could be that he's using Old Testament images so that the guards that are looking at it just look at this and go, what are these dragons, and what are these stars, and oh my goodness, just send out the letter. But if it was more um, applicable, they might have just... You know, gotten rid of it or tried to change it. And so a little bit of this very well could be that he wants you to use kind of the Old Testament as the key to open up what he's talking about. So we have this pregnant woman. Some believe that this pregnant woman is Mary. Some believe that it is the church and some believe that it's Israel. Now let's go through a couple of these and I'll just give you my take and feel free to agree or disagree. So first off, Mary. Is this woman Mary? Well, it would make sense realistically because Mary was the one that gave birth to Jesus. But if you take a step back, it makes it very difficult to understand because Mary plays no part in the end times. Israel does. So it would be very difficult for it to be Mary. Some believe that the pregnant woman is the church. Well, again, that would be very difficult because Jesus birthed the church. The church didn't birth Jesus. So for it to be the church... It would, be, it would be hard to reconcile the whole entire story. Now, the 12 stars is our clue. Who in the Old Testament is known for mothering anything 12? The nation of Israel, right? Genesis 37, 9 gives us a clue. It quotes the Hebrew forefather Joseph. I've had another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. Shall your mother and I... Your brothers indeed bow down to the earth before you. So Israel there is talked about as a mother. In the Old Testament, Israel is often compared to a woman and even a woman in travail. You can write down Isaiah 54, 5, 66 and 7, Jeremiah 3, 6 through 10, and Micah 4, 10 and 5, 2 and 3. The pregnant woman here seems to be none other than the nation Israel. And it would make sense because even from the beginning, the reason why Israel was created was to give birth to a Messiah. That's kind of the whole Old Testament timeline is Israel is going to produce the Messiah. So it makes the most sense. It says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great and a fiery dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on, diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. It's very easy to understand who the child is, right? Jesus. It also gives us a timeline of, of what we're talking about here. Now, the dragon is very interesting. You say, no, okay, who, who, who is the dragon? A couple verses later, it's going to tell us that it's Satan. 
Okay, the seven heads and the ten horns, they're going to represent the original ten kingdoms, which three were subdued by the little horn of Daniel chapter 7, who will be identified with the world, the world ruler of the great tribulation who reigns over a revived Roman Empire. We're going to get to that in just a couple verses. Now, a couple things to kind of note here is um, in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, we learn of the dragon or Satan's origin. He was formerly the archangel Lucifer, a beautiful and a musical creature. Some folks think that he was heaven's worship leader. That is until pride entered his heart. And at that point, he stopped worshiping God and worshiped himself. That's when God gave him the boot. In Luke 10, 18, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Jesus was there at the expulsion of Lucifer. So we also have in here a third of the stars that are being talked about left with Lucifer. And those are angels. We also get a little bit more of a backstory of the birth of Jesus. Didn't ever know that there was a dragon at the nativity set, right? It says that Satan stood before the woman trying to devour the child. Let's chew on that for a minute. At this time in history, we believe that Satan is the ruler of the world. And we believe his jealousy and his fear are being lived out in the leaders that were also trying to kill this baby. Satan was nervous about a baby coming to take his throne. And he was right. When Jesus was born, you could say that he slipped in behind enemy territory. With God now taking on the form of the man, the possibility of a man that could live a perfect life and redeem all mankind was in place. Satan couldn't do anything. It's kind of like I know as a Pittsburgh Steeler when you're up by three and Tom Brady gets the ball with a minute and a half left. You know it's over. The only thing that's going to save you is if... He gets hurt. And that's exactly the way that Satan felt at this time. Once he realized that Jesus had hit the scene, he knows, oh, yikes, here we go. <clears throat> it was only a matter of time. So the battle continues. Satan's time of reigning is coming to an end. Let's go back to verse 6. It says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,200 in 60 days. So here again, we have this time frame. Israel will flee into the wilderness for 1260 days or three and a half years. So we see that three and a half year timeline again. Again, now if this was a movie, the screen would go black and it would say thousands of years from now. We're now going to fast forward from 32 AD to sometime in the future, which we don't know. Let's go to verse seven. It says, then a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the world, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So let's pause right there for a minute. So we're in the future, and something done on earth has caused a war in heaven. Most likely, it is Satan's blasphemy in the temple. So you go, okay, now wait a minute. So Satan at one point was in heaven. He was kicked out of heaven, but now he's going back up into heaven. What well, is tricky because he does have access. Right? We know in the book of Job, remember how it starts, God and Satan are talking back and forth. You know, there's another part in um, Zechariah 3.13 where he is um, basically accusing Joshua, right? And we know that he also has access to heaven. Well, it's come to a boiling point where there is now this battle in heaven. And this war is going to be a wild one. I think, I think it's awesome to think about. Michael and Satan going back and forth. It surely will make Braveheart seem like a couple siblings fighting, right? These angels have the power to kill 187,000 people in a night. Think about them battling each other. It will be an epic scene like we've never seen before. But I want you to notice something. Michael 
is an angel. He is a created being and he fought and prevailed against Satan. Doesn't that help you to put things in perspective? Jesus is the creator. He is all powerful. Satan has no chance with Jesus. He didn't even have a chance against Michael. And so it helps us to understand Jesus' power. He is all powerful. Let's go on to verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accuses them before God day and night has been cast down and they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, O you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. In the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Let's pause right there for a minute. A couple things that I just would love to chew on for a minute. Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ have come. What an amazing time. It says, for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. Satan is the accuser. This is a characteristic that we should not aim to have. Satan is, is, is called an accuser. And so what we realize is that's not a good thing. We don't want to be known as somebody that accuses people. It's not a good characteristic. Pastor Sandy Adams, which I'm going to use a bunch of his stuff today. He, he put this this verse in a really interesting way. Listen to what he said. He said, Satan wants to bury us under an avalanche of guilt and condemnation. Yet Jesus was buried. So we don't have to be. He died in our place to gain our pardon. Hang your hopes on Romans eight. One. There is therefore now no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Don't let Satan use your failures to destroy your faith. Isn't that awesome? And then it says, and they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. There's three really important attitudes to note here. And if you're looking to build a strong faith, these are three things to hang on to. Number one, the blood of the lamb. There is power in the blood of Jesus because it covers us. It gives us righteousness. And there's power in that. There's saving power. When his blood was shed on the cross, it gave us the ability to be reconciled back to God. And that gives us, his believers, his power. Two, the word of their testimony. I love this. This means that we have to know our Jesus story. And you've got to be able to speak it efficiently. Because there's something happens when you speak your story that... When you talk about religion or beliefs or different things with people, a lot of times they can debate anything, right? One of the things that people really struggle to debate is your story. When you share what Jesus has done in your life, it almost disarms people so that they go, oh my goodness. And so it's wild when you pair a strong testimony with with the blood of Jesus, it unlocks this power. And then there's a third thing. It says, and they did not love their lives to the death. And this is selflessness. And this is to be the life of a Christian. We're covered by the blood of Jesus. We know our testimony. We know our Jesus story. And we serve self-sacrificially. Let's go into verse 12. It says, therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And the sea, for the devil has come down having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Listen, this may be one that you want to come back to because there's going to come a time where we're not going to be dealing with the things that we're dealing with right now. The devil's time is limited, his days are numbered. We started out by praising in heaven with the elders because the time was at hand. They said, it's on. There's no more talking about biblical prophecy. It is unfolding right in front of us. 
And that's what's awesome is there's coming a time where Satan's reign here on earth will come to a close. Let's keep going. It says, now when the dragon, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. Let's pause right there for a minute. <clears throat> now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Like what we've been reading in the papers all week? The dragon being frustrated at this woman and chasing this woman and looking to devour her. If you turned on the news, one of the things that you realize is that Israel is battling again. And, you know, when you talk about things with, with Israel and Palestine and, what, you know, if you, if you don't have the biblical timeline, a lot of it doesn't make sense. Right? Most people, when you, when you talk about what is going on, they go, yeah, I don't know. It seems like they've just been fighting forever. And they will continue to fight. Satan has been trying to wipe out Israel since the book of Genesis. And it has continued all the way through the ages. And there's times where he came close. And it will continue until all of this is taken care of. And so when we turn on the TV and we see Israel and Palestine bombing, part of us goes, sounds about right. <clears throat> this dragon has been cast down to the earth. He's persecuting the woman who gave birth to the male child. Verse 14, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. This is kind of a saying for three and a half years, times, times and half a time. Recall what Jesus told the Jews in Matthew 24 and 16. When you see the Antichrist defile the temple, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, run for the hills. Terrible persecution is on the horizon. And so we're seeing fulfillment of what Jesus said would happen actually taking place in the book of Revelation. Let's keep going. Verse 15. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman. And he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's pause and let's break down a couple of these things. Like a, when it says like a flood, okay, that's, that's kind of a phrase like an invading army. And it says in, in verse 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you followed anything with Israel, one thing that you'll realize is that people have just been enraged with them for thousands of years. Hitler tried to wipe them off the face of the earth. It almost seemed like he was, had an obsessive rage against Israel. Makes sense. He was being used by the enemy. The people that are trying to wipe Israel off the face of the earth right now are enraged. Why? Because the enemy wants to do that. When Satan gets frustrated at not being able to kill the Jews, he will attack anyone that embraces Jesus. So this is going to be those that have... Uh, Put their faith in Jesus after the tribulation that still have to live through this time. And so Satan is then going to attack them. Let's keep going. It says, then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns, ten crowns. And on his heads, a blasphemous name. What is going on here? So this is the leader, the evil leader who is Antichrist. 
He's been referred to as many things throughout Scripture. Here he is given the name the Beast. Now at this point, the Antichrist has been a peacemaker. Remember in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, he hit the scene and he brokered a deal. It seems as he will have brokered a deal between the, um, the Palestinians, the Arabs, and the Israelites. And it's going to protect the Israelites for seven years. The protection has given Israel the ability to rebuild the temple. But then, in the middle of the seven years, the Antichrist will stop the relig religious rituals in the temple and he will order to be worshipped. Okay, so we can see a little bit of how this how this is able to come to be. These ten horns, which if you go through and, and read these two chapters, there's a lot of representations. I'm not going to cover all of them because not all of them totally make sense to me. Some people believe that the dragon was the color red for some reasons. Again, if it's not used in the Old Testament, I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant. So lots of things that could be symbols, but I'm going to give ones that, that I'm fairly certain of. The ten horns, ten crowns, they represent ten nations. And it seems that the ten nations of Europe are a revived Roman Empire. And we'll go over that here in a minute. <clears throat> now it says, verse 2, Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. The beast is like a leopard, feet like a bear, mouth like a lion. All right, Bible student, where have we seen these images before? Daniel chapter 7. So let's flip to Daniel 7. Now there's two places where Daniel saw exotic symbols of this time to come. In Daniel 2, there was this dream where he was interpreted where there was this statue. It had a head of gold, a breast and arms of silver, a belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron and feet of ten toes of mixed, mixed iron with clay. Right, and so we have this huge statue, remember, that Daniel had, had, um, had, had interpreted in a dream. And it was pointing to the end times. But there was also this dream that he has in Revelation chapter or in Daniel chapter 7. Look at what it says in verse year, in verse 7. In the first year, Belteshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion. And had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made to stand on the two feet like a man. And the man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it raised up on its side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one coming up among them. Form who three of the first horns were, were plucked out of the roots, and there in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. So Daniel has this dream of the end times. He saw this statue that represents these kingdoms, and then he saw these four beasts. It's very interesting because if we keep reading in Daniel, he gives an interpretation or he gives an explanation of this. Let's skip to verse 15. Daniel's going to explain a little bit more, which just makes this whole thing come to life. 
Listen to what he says in verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to, to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all of this. So he told me and made known the interpretation of these things, which is kind of hilarious, right? So Daniel is really struggling with what in the world he saw. He asked, okay, what do you think about this? And then, and then here comes the interpretation. Those beasts, which are four, are four kings, which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and forever and ever. And I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast. That's the one we're reading about in, in Revelation. Which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces, and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns which were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely the horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until Ancient of Days came, and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom of earth, which shall be different from the other kingdoms. And shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it into pieces. The ten horns are ten kings. Who shall arise from this kingdom? And shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue the three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, and shall persecute the saints of the Most High. And he shall intend to change times and the law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand. For a time, in times, and half a time. Isn't that wild? First off, isn't it wild that that same saying is used? So we have this three and a half years again. So Daniel had this wild dream that these, these kingdoms and kings would become rulers. And he's chewing on all of this. And he goes, okay, I, I kind of understand this. But the fourth one is really what has me troubled. And what he's seeing is this beast that rises up in the end times. And so as we go back to the book of Revelation, we see all of these things coming to take place. Daniel was giving a vision of 2,500 years of Gentile world domination. He saw four great and awful beasts that rose up against Israel. The lion was Babylon. The great bear was Persia. And the leopard was Greece. As we go through Daniel, we get to dig into this even more. But the fourth beast that is described is very an inter it's a it's a really interesting one. I believe that it is Rome. If you look back at the fourth beast described in the statue, it says that it has ten toes. Very interesting, and that's why we're always looking for kind of a ten nation kingdom. United Nations, we're always looking for, is there 10? Because we believe that that's how this will all practically play out. This kingdom will take over the whole earth. And out of the nations, one will arise. And so this beast is going to broker a deal with all of these nations to come together under one flag. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 3. And I saw one of the heads as if it had been mortally wounded. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Let's pause right there for a minute. So some people look on at this and they go, Oh my goodness, this, this, this beast, it has power over death. Now, the problem is the text doesn't say that. Look at what it says. I saw one of his heads as if it had as if it had been mortally wounded. Okay, so just imagine that you know that you saw somebody get shot, you believe that they're dead, and then they rose from it. You would think, oh my goodness, this person has the power over death. The problem is it's a magic trick. But it's done so well that you start to believe that it's actually true. 
And we see that kind of all the time, right? Somebody does an incredible magic trick and we think like, oh, I remember when I was in college, it was, uh, what was that guy's name? David Blaine, right? He could do these magic tricks and you thought like, oh my goodness, this guy has like supernatural abilities, or Chris Angel, that was another guy. He would do these things and you're like, this guy is incredible. And then you watch one of those shows and you see how they do it and you go, oh, like a fourth grader could do that. All he did was hide it here behind his hand and I thought he was like doing this incredible trick. That's exactly what will happen here. But the world will be duped and they will begin to worship him because of a trick, just a sleight of hand. Look at verse 5. It gets worse. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Three. We keep going into this timetable. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life. And the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Hear the patience and the faith of the saints. Okay, now up until this point. Some very interesting things have happened. It seems like this world leader, he's preached tolerance. He's gotten all of these different tribes and nations to come in under one religious umbrella. Now look at our world this last week and tell me how easy it is to get a nation that is Muslim to come under the same umbrella as Israel. It's almost impossible now throw in all the other different nations. You know, in India, they, they're Hindu. And this world leader has gotten them to the point where they say, hey, let's all come together. How would you do that? Tolerance. Right? If, if this guy was driving a car, he'd have a coexist bumper sticker on the back. And the trouble with tolerance is that it leads to oppression. Think about what it would take to get all the nations to go, hey, let's get along. You know, I was talking with a guy yesterday and he said, I don't understand how Palestine and Israel can't get along. I didn't say this, but it's because you don't understand. They want to destroy Israel. They want to kill them. How do you, how do you get along with somebody like that? You, you don't. And that's okay. You go, but Jesus came so that the world would be filled with peace. No, he didn't. He came to save people. He actually said at one point, when I come, your families are going to start battling with each other. Parents against kids, brothers against sisters. This is, this is, this is, I didn't come for tolerance. I came to save. And the Antichrist is going to come in and he's going to go, hey, let's tolerate each other. And you see it happening today, don't you? Everybody wants us to tolerate things, but if you'll notice, they actually don't tolerate things. Some of the most, the most, the people that are claiming tolerance and coexistence, they actually don't want that. And if you look at the way that they vote and the way that they do things, you'll realize that. And so that's how it'll come in. Tolerance. Verse 7, it says, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Now, this is a very interesting section. And this is one of the reasons why I believe that the rapture has happened. In Matthew 16 and 18, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So if the church is there, how is Satan prevailing against them? Jesus said that won't happen. So because it is happening, we know that the church can't be there. Remember, I said that we were going to be talking about two beasts. Well, here comes the second of what Pastor Sandy Adams calls the beastie boys. Watch this, verse 11. Then I saw another beast come out of the earth. 
He had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. And he exercised all authority of the first beast in his presence, and caused the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Now the second beast, he will get all of the religions to put aside their differences and come together. Verse 13, he performs great signs so that even that he even makes fire come down from heaven in the earth in the sight of men. Now Malachi prophesied that Elijah would appear before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So this second beast, he seems to be not so much a, a, um, a false uh, Jesus at that point. At this point, he seems to be a false Elijah. Remember that the Jews would be looking for somebody with the power of Elijah. So one that hits the scene that's able to do a little bit of magic, he makes people believe that he's Elijah. Verse 14, and he, dece he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs, which he has granted to do in the sight of beasts, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship, not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So here's the flip. The deception has happened, and now it's, it's introduced the grand scheme. It says this, this image is put in front of them, the image of the beast that they should speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So this beast comes in, he gets everybody to walk together in coexistence. And then when he has everyone's allegiance, he flips the switch and he makes all worship the image of the beast. Now this, this image, you go, what in the world is it? And we typically think that it's a statue. The only problem is it interacts. You go, what, is, what does that mean? What is this thing? I don't know. This image is, is it's, it's something that has the ability to interact. It speaks and it kills. And so I'd love to be able to tell you, I, I listened to lots of guesses this week about what the image is. The fact of the matter is I'm really not sure. But we know that at some point this will happen. That will be made to, to worship this image. And if they don't, they will be killed. Let's read on. It says, And he causes all, both great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Well, let me ask you, what would you do to feed your family? anything right I have never lived in a time where people were given such ultimatums and, and for one example just think about what would you do for toilet paper gosh we spent so much money on toilet paper this last year right it was crazy to the point where we were having conversations in our household, like, well, you know, like we do have like a sprayer in the house. Like this is out of control. Here the people are given an ultimatum. Do this or, or, or else. You say, hold on. I've heard this before. You did. This week, the president of the United States issued, issued an ultimatum to us. Get vaccinated or wear a mask. You say, Ben, you don't think that Joe Biden's the, the beast, do you? I don't. I really don't. And I'll show you why in a minute. But all of us can see how it will happen, right? Remember, the end times, we're going to get little glimpses of it. And then it'll get stronger with intensity. And it'll get stronger when it comes to repetition. <clears throat> I don't believe that things that we're seeing right now are the mark of the beast. I don't think that vaccine passports are the mark of the beast, but it shows you how it'll happen. Just in the last two weeks, there have been stores that have said, if you don't have this, you will not be able to shop here. 
There are governors that are floating the idea of if you don't have this vaccine, you're not going to be able to go to these different places. And what is happening? It's an ultimatum. Do this or else. Not saying that that's how it's going to happen, but you can see how this is all being put into place. You take the mark of the beast or else. And think about what will people do? If you're not able to go to Kroger or Walmart or Aldi unless you have this mark, what are you going to do? You know, my, my neighbor, Glenn, that I spend a lot of time with, he started, when, when everything was happening with COVID, he started telling me about all of his different plans if things go really bad. Right? He's got a water filter in his house that we also have. That he, when he bought the water filter, he asked them, he said, he said, listen, if I lived in Flint, Michigan, could I put water through this and drink it? And they said, yes. He goes, so Ben, I'll, I'll go down and get water in the, in the river, which we live right across from the river. And th that's how I'll go. And then he started telling me about how he's going to hunt. He's going to do all these things. And one of the things that I realized is I'm dead. <laughs> I, 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 I am not prepared like others are. And if you were to look around at our country, if they came in and said, you can't shop at Aldi or Walmart or do this unless you have this mark. And it doesn't have to be anything crazy. It could be just a little chip that you put on your card or is placed in your hand. You go, Ben, that's never going to happen. That's happening right now. Over the last thousands of years of the church, they've looked at these things and went, how in the world would this even happen? There are companies right now that are putting chips inside of your hand. You can put your credit card info in your body so that it would be protected from identity theft. It's not like these things are that far away. And I think it's exciting. We're actually the closest that we've ever been. And so when I hear things like vaccine passports and people say, is that the mark of the beast? It sure looks like we're close. Now, the reason why I don't believe that Joe Biden is the Antichrist is verse 18. And listen, there's been a lot of people that we've thought have been the Antichrist over time, right? Caesar Nero, he was supposed to have been Ronald Reagan at one point. You know, he was talked about as the Antichrist. President Bill Clinton, President Obama, all the presidents seem to get dubbed by either side as the Antichrist, right? Verse 18, I think, is going to give us a very interesting take on who this person could be. <clears throat> Look at what it says in verse 18. It says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. John ends by, by, by sharing an incredible nugget, I think, of wisdom. Now, six is the number of man. So it gives us a couple things to chew on. Again, this week I listened to a message by Sandy Adams, and I've taken so many of his things this week, so I just want to shout him out. But his nugget on this I thought was just incredible. Listen to what he said. He shared that the only other time that the number 666 or 666 is used in the Bible is in reference to King Solomon. Hmm. 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 13 lists Solomon's yearly allotment of gold as 666 talents. There's another connection between Solomon and this number. In 1 Kings 10, when we looked at Solomon's throne, you saw six lions on the left, six steps in the center, six lions on the right. Again, 666. Six, six. You go, okay, what does that mean? You, what do I, I'm not sure that I'm totally understanding it very well could be that the person, the Antichrist that comes as the beast with this number 666 will look a lot more like King Solomon than Darth Vader. What was King Solomon known for? Dude was so wise. God blessed him with wisdom where people just scratched their head when they left. Oh my goodness, how did he come up with that? This one that is to come, the Antichrist, could it very well be that he's going to come with that same type of a spirit that people will look on and marvel and they'll just go, this guy, he is so wise. And that's the way it'll have to be, right? To come to broker a deal that'll get Palestine and Israel to become buddies. You could solve that. 
people would look on and go, oh my, this guy, incredible wisdom. And so for that reason, I struggle for it being Joe Biden or basically any of the other presidents that we've had. He's not there, right? And so when that person comes, we're going to be duped because I think we're looking for a tyrant. We're looking for somebody that will be so evil. But at first, we'll look on. We won't look on. The people will look on and they'll go, we've never seen a person like this. And they'll all be tricked. I want you to go back to Daniel 7, and this is where we'll close today. I want to chew on this for a minute. I want to look back at what did Daniel do after this whole prophecy was put in his lap. And gang, I know that chapter 12 and 13, this is a lot. It's almost as much as chapter 10 and 11. They just keep getting more and more intense, right? You didn't think you were going to be in bronze statues and all these different beasts today. But this is how things will unfold. And at the end of Daniel seeing this, this vision, look at how it ends in verse 28. It says, this is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. I think it was a really healthy thing to do what Daniel just did there. He took all of this craziness that he saw unfolding and it greatly troubled him. And gang, I think that that's a really healthy thing for us to do. Although I'm excited that I'm not going to be here for any of this, I know that there's a lot of people that will. And if it were to happen right now, it'd be a lot of people that I love. And sometimes it's good to just... I was at a funeral yesterday and one of the verses that I shared was talking about it's better to be at a funeral than it is to be at a party. And the verse basically talks about that it is a healthy thing to have these reflections. And there's times where I think that we need to look at these things and look at what all is going to happen and understand that if this were to happen right now, there's a lot of people that go to church every Sunday that haven't given their lives to Jesus that are going to be experiencing this. There's going to be a lot of our family and friends and our neighbors and our bosses and our coworkers that are going to experience this. And I think this is a great time to just hmm, be a little bit troubled about what is coming our way. It says that his countenance changed. His appearance, his, the way that he was feeling, it changed. He said, and I kept this matter in my heart. I believe that the section that we're in and the reason why we're in it as a group is because it's a warning. These things are coming soon. We don't know how soon, but very soon. And it helps us to realize how fragile life is. And so listen, as we close, I just want to have a little bit of time to realize that Jesus has given us the way out. And so if there's, any, if there's anyone in here where you've got some things that you need to sort out and reconcile with the Lord, I'd ask that you come up afterwards and we'll pray together. But as we close, just chew on some of these things and think about, man, what does this mean in my life? And is there anybody that I can share with this week? Because these things are coming. But what is so cool is that we as the church, as Ruby had sang earlier, I, I shared with her, and if you want to come back up, Ruby. I love when we have songs that we can sing the verses that we just read. And it is just remarkable that we as the church, we will overcome. If the toughest times were to come our ways, we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And isn't that an incredible thing for us as his church? Amen. Let's pray and then we'll, we'll end in song. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the book of Revelation that we get to learn more about you, Lord, about how you are going to unfold these end times. We are thankful that you are unveiling all of this to us and you, you're showing us what these events will look like. We're thankful for Daniel and the work that you did through him and how you've pointed us 
back to these end times. God, we pray for those that aren't right with you right now. And we pray that you would soften their hearts, turn them to you this week. We pray for opportunities to share with those that are around us. We pray that you would embolden us and strengthen us in your ways. It is in Jesus' name we pray.